think about the profound influence of the Bible on the world, the way that it has shaped our culture, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, it's probably a good idea that you know at least what it says. It's going to be about us taking and reading the Bible. Welcome back to the Take and Read podcast. I have Casey Noble with us back in studio. And uh, yeah, it's always a joy to have you in the studio. It is always a joy to be here. And there's uh, there's been like over time, there tends to be interaction from uh, the listeners with with things that you say. And, and so I'm always excited to have you back. All right. So. Welcome back. I'm excited to dive in today. Uh, before we dive in, what just kind of catch me up? What's been going on in your world? What, yeah, what's life kind of yeah. throwing at you these days? Well, gosh, uh, there's always life being thrown. I have four kiddos, you know, so there's mm-hmm. always, um, you know, in in the perspective of the Lord, one thing that's really I've been thinking a lot about lately is. What does it look like to actually be a disciple right now in 2022? What does it what does it consist of? What does it practically look like? That's a great question. Yeah. Like what does it really what does it look like to be with Jesus, to do what he's doing, to you mm-hmm. know, kind of those that's really been weighing heavy on and what does it look like to be a member of a church? Hmm. You know, what does it look like to I know it looks like more than showing up and listening to a sermon and maybe liking or not liking worship and leaving. Yeah. I know it's more than that. So I've just been really thinking about that a lot lately. Yeah. Um, a couple episodes ago had LJ on and he, he used this analogy that I just found to be priceless that he, when he's working with, uh, the younger kids, he talks about their relationship with Christ Although sometimes we feel like that's just one piece of the puzzle. So whether that means being a member of a church or participating in in church, like if if life is this puzzle and you've got little league here and you've got, you know, some, some other, like you got work here or, or whatever, like you've got all these pieces to your life. And so sometimes people will approach their walk with the Lord or even their identity as a Christian that's another piece. And you want to have all these pieces in order to have a complete life. And what LJ says is, no, 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 no. So when you make a puzzle, it's Jesus isn't even like the whole puzzle. He's the table that the puzzle's oh, being yeah, put good. together on, mm-hmm. that it's behind everything. And it's not another piece. It's not even a part of the puzzle. It's the foundation of everything in your life. Mm, that's good. And then if you've ever tried to put a puzzle together, like in air, you can't like there's, you need a foundation, you need a surface with which everything can be placed on and then pieced together. And I thought, man, that is such a good way to look at it and kind of a paradigm shift, I mm-hmm. think for a lot of people. And especially for kids and for grown ups. Right. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah. so I told him later, Hey, I'm going to take that. And uh-huh, I'm gonna use Cause it. that's so really good. People listening, they may go, yeah, you, LJ said it. You can't take credit. And I'm not trying to take credit. It's totally LJ. But what's but that I'm saying? Use it a lot. Like if you're saying something new in Christianity, <laughs> then, <laughs> bring it out. There, there's yeah. nothing new. You should yeah, be novelties. saying it's also called heresy usually. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, yeah. so, well, that's good. And as you wrestle with that, what, what kind of comes to the surface, at least right now, yeah. what seems to be sh- taking shape around, what does it look like to be a disciple, a mm-hmm. follower of Jesus today, or what does it mean to be a member of a church? Yeah. Well, you know, just some pops that, that just come into my head are things like, um, I've been thinking a lot about like, for most of history, it required a significant sacrifice to being a follower of Jesus. It usually required something that looked so different that everyone could identify. Like first mm-hmm. century Christians, you know, they shared their belongings. They, you know, the, it was ev- evidence. Some even choosing to live in poverty to be the symbolism of Christianity. Right. You know, like, and now in many ways we could be, a, we could identify as a Christian and never look any different than mm-hmm. anybody else in the world. And so I, I'm wondering what it looks like not to live in that realm because I don't think it's probably a place, <laughs> you know, yeah. how there's like not, there's, there's not a half Christian. There's, right. So I've been thinking a lot about that and I've been thinking a lot about in, in the old Testament in with idols, 
you see, so, so there's actually a guy, smart guy, G.K. Beale, wrote a book called uh, You Become What You Worship. Mm-hmm. And in the Old Testament, they started, when they worshiped idols, they would start to look like those idols, not physically, but the way they behaved started to look like those mm-hmm. idols. Same thing with Jesus, I'm thinking, right? I'm, it's got to apply both ways. Right. So I'm thinking what what you you become, what you worship. Yeah. So the more authentically and the more often and the more deeply I'm worshiping Jesus, the more I'm going to become like Jesus. Yeah. So, and the goal isn't to just start out and start to look weird or right. look different. Yeah. The goal is I want to I want to look like my teacher. I want to yes. look like my savior. I want it which to be is going to then cause me to probably be marginalized. Mm-hmm. There's going to be times where I don't look trendy. I, my life doesn't match up with the trend. And in reality, that's that's okay. Yeah, it's a hard line cuz you're like you're right. I don't want to just be weird. Yeah. I'm not just going to do things to be but um, if I'm choosing the things that Jesus chose, it, it's probably, it's going to be different. Yeah. So I've just been thinking about that. That's what good. It, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Well, what we look at today, um, there's a, we're going to encounter someone in scripture who wrestles with the same question. Yes. And I don't know if you knew that, but here Let's we see. go. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 10 in Mark. and uh, we slowly but surely we make our way uh, ever so carefully through the text and so we're in Mark chapter 10 and we're looking at verse 17 and this is kind of a bigger pericope of, of text so we've we've got several verses because there's there's quite a kind of a more narrative scene that occurs and so we'll take a look at the whole thing and then we'll kind of true to form we'll we'll stick with our pattern of what does it say? What does it mean? And then why is it significant for us today? So here we go. We are reading out of the English Standard Version, the ESV Bible. And so if you're following along and you notice things are different in yours, it may be just a different translation. And that's just a good place to to kind of hang out and force yourself to kind of think through as you hear it from us and as you read it in your own text. So here we go, starting in Mark chapter 10. Verse 17, and he was setting out on his journey. This is, uh, this is Jesus. Um, the, he's the he. So, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know, the commandments do not murder Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? (laughs) Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now and this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Whew, there's a yeah, lot there. There's a lot. There's a ton there. So uh, let's, let's just kind of start from the beginning. Uh, do we understand the scene that's happening here? What What's playing out? Do we know who's there and kind of what's, What's playing out? What do you mm-hmm. see? 
So I, I, I like to think about where's this journey that he's setting out to. So I'm looking back on the last kind of set up before now. Where's he coming from? Where is he going to? Is he, is he are we going to Jericho? Are we in Jericho yet? Uh, it looks like uh, they're not quite there yet. Judea. So his face is set upon yep. Jerusalem, though, right? He, yep. know, he We're going towards Jerusalem. Yep. He's uh, in the, 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 the verses following this. It says, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. So, yeah, they're still on their, their way to Jerusalem, and they're getting much closer. Yeah. So um, he's just setting out on the journey, and mm-hmm. a man runs up. So... You know, everything's packed up. They're ready to go. They're heading on to the next place. And this guy understands him to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. And he calls him good teacher. So you've got this this young man. Uh, and he has great possessions, we understand, from the text. And his interest is in eternal life. What must he do? to inherit eternal life. Mm -hmm. Like what is it that that he can do to either manufacture, accomplish or create this eternal life? I have everything else. How do I get eternal life? I got everything else. I've, you know, what do I have to do now to have this eternal life that you speak of? It's interesting um, at the front end, he calls him good teacher and Jesus takes issue with that first. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh he says, you call me good. No one is good except God alone. Uh, and do you know the commandment? So he doesn't even give the guy a chance to respond to that. Mm. He just makes that statement like, okay, so you call me good. Just by the way, you know, no one's good except for God. So why, just, do, who, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Yeah. Which is one of those Jesus Jedi mind tricks. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it really, I mean, that's. Yeah, that's really good. So we've got this uh, this exchange, and essentially what Jesus does, it looks like, is he kind of summarizes the commandments, right? Okay, you know these commandments. This is These are the things that we do. We keep the commandments. This is from early on, from Moses. These, this is what one does. And, uh, and then the guy's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I've done all that. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm good. I've never... I did it. And so... Obviously, like you and I know, yeah, fat chance. Like, that's quite a statement. It's quite a bold. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've never sinned, essentially. Yeah, he's saying I'm good. I've I've lived a perfect life. So now, what else do I need to do? And so he's like, okay, Jesus, knowing his heart clearly, um, because he's like, teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Uh my favorite part of this loved him looking at him loved him i right there i would say and casey what does that mean he looks at him and he loves him like did he not love him at right he i i love that because there's a very much so a verb there not an emotion very much so a verb my my story would have said and casey looking at him said you are such a liar you have been sinning since you're, you, you did not do any of this. Yeah, if you were there and you had a chance yeah. to interact, you'd be like, liar. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus, Mm-mm. looking at him, loved him. And I mean, we're fixing to see more yeah. why, but I love that. So he loved him and said to him, well, you lack one thing. So Jesus is aware of the scenario and doesn't correct him about the, the claim of perfection, but just points out you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. So it's not like a you're giving up, you're you're exchanging, you're you're giving all that you have here, earthly, in order to inherit this treasure in heaven. He asked initially, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, Go sell all that you have, obtaining treasure in heaven by doing this, and then come and follow me. Mm. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So we even get a, a sense of why he was sorrowful, mm-hmm. why that's that's something that when Jesus says you lack one thing, Jesus identifies it's a it's a heart condition that this man has. His well, we don't know if it's like his identity, his legitimacy, 
um, his all true desire, that, yeah. like all of this stuff must be tied to his possessions. And those are the things that, that he's relying on or mm-hmm. hoping in that's going to secure for him yeah. status, meaning. Because Jesus was whatever. Jesus was jumping right to the heart. That's why he didn't spend any time suffering a fool right back here when he said, I've, I've kept all those still. Jesus was like, well, we're not even talking about that right now. Clearly you have never sinned. That's not true. Because he knew where he was going. Well, and, and you're, yeah, you flew by a statement. You just said, Jesus doesn't suffer a fool. There, There is a sense in which in the Proverbs, it says, do not respond to a fool according to his mm-hmm. folly, right? There's, there's a foolishness to claim you're sinless. And so yeah. that's a waste of time to try to get in there and convince him otherwise like that. So go to the heart of the matter, which is, well, he's clearly like over, um, not compensating, but he's, he's, he's thinks very much of himself. Mm-hmm. And so he's very confident. Maybe has done very well for himself is very successful. If he has great possessions, probably is highly honored. If he's rich in a community, mm-hmm. he's going to be favored by other humanity, other humans. They're going, wow, he's got something figured out. So there's this sense in which all of this is, you know, kind of assumed, but given what we know about the culture, there's going to be some status associated with wealth. And so Jesus jumps to the heart of the issue and the man is disheartened when it, when it's like the one thing you lack is give away everything. So it's like he comes to him and is trying to make the case that he doesn't lack anything. Mm-hmm. I've got all the stuff. Yeah. I've got great possessions. I've, I've, I've done lived, all the things. I've done all the things. Almost like he's going, hey, will you just kind of let me know I'm in? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm coming to you. What do I need to do? What else do I need to do? And he's hoping maybe for a, no, you're good. Yeah. And instead he gets, yeah, you've got all this stuff. Now sell everything. You, you'll obtain treasure in yeah. heaven. Now follow me. And he just can't do it. And it's funny because it's evident where we're going. We, I mean, we can see this hindsight's twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. As soon as he says, "Good teacher," yeah, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because right then he's he's seeing Jesus as teacher and not savior. Mm-hmm. So we're we're already seeing a glimpse of this. Mm-hmm. And then when Jesus rolls through the basically the Ten Commandments, right, and the man saying, "Yes, I I have." I, God is my boss. I do everything that God tells me to do. I, I follow and obey God. Mm-hmm. And then instantly Jesus kind of jumps on him. We, we, we turn it and we see God may be your boss, but I'm not your savior. Mm. Your belongings are your savior. Yeah. And we see, we see that really quickly. His savior is his stuff, his stuff, his, his possessions, his, who he is in the world with the things he the things that he gets when he walks down the street and people bow to him as a rich young ruler. And there's also in the his question an assumption that he can do something to save himself. Mm-hmm. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Like yeah. there's something I can do to secure this eternal life that And he would have known as a Jewish guy, he would have known what is it, how you inherit you keep all the rules and you do it perfectly. Yeah. That's So yeah, there's there's a Either a yourself is the savior, your stuff is your savior, but your security and your significance is wrapped up in your mm-hmm. stuff and self. Like that's what's on display here. And Jesus, man, just nails it, right? Yeah. Of course he does because he's Jesus. Because he's Jesus. Um, all right. So then now we move to kind of the second half where this dialogue and this engagement with this um, young man is is finished. Yeah. The man leaves. He's disheartened. He went away sorrowful for he, he had great possessions. Eyes, yeah. yeah. Just, just disheartened. Now Jesus looks around and said to his disciples. So now he's going into teaching mode. They've all probably witnessed this episode. They're all getting ready to hit, hit mm-hmm. the road, right? They're getting ready to throw this guy runs up. He has this dialogue. The guy leaves just disheartened. And it's almost, you get the sense also here that the disciples, the way it says, and Jesus looked around, that the disciples were like, and, and adding what we're going to read in here, love itself. I was like, what? Wait, hold on. What, he's Jesus? kind of looking around, seeing their faces They're like, like, like oh, I've got to address this. Hold on. He's like, all right, let's unpack this. So he says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom. Not impossible, notice, mm-hmm. just how difficult it is. 
And the disciples were amazed at his words. So something about that. They're like, okay, so it's going to be tough for rich people. And several of those people there are not rich people. Mm-hmm. They're, they're poor people. The disciples are made up of mostly, I mean, we don't necessarily know what Matthew's um, bank account looked like, but it was probably pretty healthy mm-hmm. given his, his role as a tax collector. But regardless, they're amazed at this, okay? Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. And then he gives this kind of analogy. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, you'll have some biblical commentators will get into what the eye of a needle means, mm-hmm. but th- what he's saying is that it it's physically impossible, right? It's physically impossible for a needle that sews th- with thread, mm-hmm. which would have been something used at the time, yeah. for a large mammal known as a camel to actually get through the needle. Some it's people are like, well, hyperbole here. Yes, exactly. He's drawing an analogy that's very hyperbolic. And so he says he's pointing out just the level of difficulty mm-hmm. for a rich person to enter. And what he's what we we have the privilege to see is this interaction with a rich person mm-hmm. and why it's so difficult. We just watched it. Yes. Because there is this tendency to put our confidence in our wealth. It causes great confidence. Yeah, Mm -hmm. confidence, maybe comfort. Like we don't want to give up stuff because Mm -hmm. we like this lifestyle. And so we're very kind of short-sighted in that, well, this life is is really all we got. And so- It masks a lot of pain. It masks a lot of needs Mm -hmm. that we can band-aid with our ability to spend. Gives us a sense of maybe um, status and value. Mm -hmm. Uh, meaning, purpose, and so there's a lot of stuff that comes with wealth, and 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 with and at that time too, obviously, right? But because right. wealth would have been a signal that someone was holy and being rewarded, yeah, though not true. Yeah, and I would say even today, I mean, we're not getting into this this just yet, but there is something to be said about status. And that we are drawn to it. Mm-hmm. We want some of it ourselves. Maybe because of the access it gives us, um, the accolades. Um, Seems like it's going to give you friends. Yeah. Um, maybe comfort, like mm-hmm. life becomes easier and, All and less things. hard. So we're, yeah, we're truly trying to, to fill up some emotional buckets and some kind of value buckets mm-hmm. with it. And so Jesus is drawing out that point with this analogy of a camel and needle and that this kind of idea of entering the kingdom of God. So being within God's kingdom and being one of his subjects, it's very difficult for wealthy people. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, so this is why they're astonished, then who can be saved? That's... If that rich man can't be saved, who will be saved? Yeah, if if rich people can't, it's difficult for rich people. In fact, it's difficult because it's like a camel mm-hmm. going through the eye of a needle. Like, well, that's that's physically impossible. So, who? There's nobody. Nobody's eligible mm-hmm. to enter the kingdom of God according to that analogy. Because maybe even if you have a smaller amount of wealth, depending on the size of the needle and the camel, it doesn't matter. Yeah, There's no needle that can allow any camel to get through it. So it doesn't matter the discrepancy there. That's... So now they're like, what? Who can be saved? And I think there's a cultural context that might be important to consider here in that Jesus's message of first and last, of poverty, of the things we see in the Beatitudes was... Revol- I mean, it, it was revolutionary. It, no, it was preposterous. Yeah that one would be blessed and be poor. It wasn't just unusual because if you were wealthy, if you had things, you were being blessed. Yeah, it's it's a completely upside down, which some people have described it as. It's like it's completely bizarro. Mm-hmm. It's upside down from any of our cultural values or standards. And so what Jesus is saying here is it would have been bizarre then too. Yes, Not it would just have been in even American more Western so. culture, but yeah, it's... Yeah, because we can see wealthy people sometimes 
And even I think people who aren't Christian can look at some wealthy people and go, man, that man's completely void of any right. moral value, you know? And, but at, at this time that wealth would have held pretty giant significance. Mm-hmm. And even, even the, they're seeing it here. Yeah. They're saying, yeah. So they're like, okay, they're blinded by it. And this is exactly where Jesus wants to go. I mm-hmm. think that I'm guessing that he knew he would be approached that morning as they're heading out on their journey by a rich guy. And I think he knew this was all going to play out. And this is exactly where he wanted to go with it. Because the first question was, what must I do? What must a man do to obtain eternal life? How do we inherit this? Well, what, what do we have to do and posture and mm-hmm. manufacture and develop and um, make happen so that we can get salvation? Basically, how do we earn this? How can we make it happen? And he's drawing the disciples to the point that they go, well, then it's impossible. No one can. No one can. And Jesus says, truly, I say to you, or they're like, well, we've, we, we've left everything. We're, we, we're following you and we've left everything behind. Good Peter. <laughs> and he's like, well, he's good. A- we're, we're, we're good to go. Yep. I mean, because we've given up everything. We have nothing. So you're not talking to us, right, right? Jesus? <laughs> He's like, truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brother, so all, no one who's left all their stuff for the sake of Christ and the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. So this idea of treasure, giving up treasure now, obtains for you something down the road, like a hundredfold, whatever you feel like you're sacrificing in this life for Christ and the gospel, he assures you it will be returned to you a hundredfold. Um. But he, the point that he makes um, right after they're like, this is impossible. With man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Which is juxtaposed to the man's question at first. Right. Which Jesus could have said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, nothing. You can't do anything. You can't do anything. You just need to trust the Lord. Mm-hmm. But he, With man, it is impossible, but not with God. So it's interesting there that Jesus didn't just respond shortly. And it clearly, start, it's from the very beginning. He's not responding shortly and clearly. No, nope, he's yeah. not, or directly. He's drawing out, who do you call good? Mm-hmm. Implying, you're right, because I am God, which he's then implying to the disciples, therefore it's possible for me to accomplish mm-hmm. this therefore, on your behalf. Mm-hmm. Right? You, you say, I'm good. Well, only God is good. Well, he didn't just, he didn't like correct him like, no, 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 don't call me God yeah. or don't call me good. He's like, well, you call me good. Only That's only, only God, God in that category. And, and, and guess you're what? you're not wrong, right? That's, I but, love it because when we look back through here, this whole point that's kind of in this second, the second uh, part after Jesus has the second section, if you will, mm-hmm. it's a continual effort of the disciples still not getting it and not getting it and recognizing how helpless they are, that mm-hmm. it has nothing to do with them. Like we see this, t- let the little children come to me yep. that we saw before now that, that we're seeing. Cause you know, a, a little child only comes to Jesus to get the blessing and nothing else. Right. They give nothing. There's yeah. nothing they can give. And we can see the disciples still aren't getting it. They're still thinking it, it's still part, it's something that I do. Mm-hmm. It's something that I, it's something of being status. It's something, it's something of having status rather. They, we just see this through this whole second part that it's a reiteration of, it's not about anything that you'll do. Mm-hmm. It's just about what I'm going to give you. Yep. You know, and, and, and then right, that's what ends right here. Mm-hmm. That we're fixing to hear his third time that he denies it. And we're going to head into the last part where he sets his face towards Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like that's what he's closing out with. He's closing out with this to say, it's not about what you have. It's not about what you'll do. Nobody on this earth will achieve anything that's the way you think it's been going. Yeah. You know? And he, he kind of summarizes the teaching with, in verse 31, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So there is a complete upside down uh, ethic and value system and a hierarchy Mm -hmm. in God's kingdom that is so counter to anything we experience in humanity. And it's one of those things that just never goes away. Mm -mm. This faulty, this faulty thinking on, 
what is valuable, what is good, uh, who, who matters and who doesn't matter, social structure, authority, power, like it just every age wrestles with this upside downness, even in the church. And it's never changed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's this just isn't a antiquated in its notion. Super, super sobering where like, okay. So as we wrestle with this, is there anything like, as you stand back and kind of mm -hmm. look at the whole thing, there's kind of two, two scenes that we see play out in this mm -hmm. text. There's one with the young man and then there's one with the disciples. What's your kind of, okay, this is what it means for them at that time and also the recipients of Mark's gospel. Yeah. You know, something that I, I'm kind of piecing together in here is this idea of, yes, you follow the rules. Yes. Uh, it's that idea of the difference in Jesus being your Lord and being your savior, mm -hmm. you know, like, yes, you follow all the rules, but is he your savior? And that that's kind of... What do you of, mean by that? Like, what's the difference there as you say that? Lord, well, Lord so versus Savior? this rich man is saying, yes, I did. I didn't murder. I committed. I've done this since I was a child. I followed all the rules. Okay. So one would be if he's your Lord, there's an authority and you're willing to totally mm -hmm. submit to yes. his authority. And, and maybe like that idea of, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yes. Like, yep. And maybe, and, and as is evident here, right. he's not totally submitting to his authority. No one ever has. You <laughs> right. know, like, but, yeah, because he doesn't do what Jesus says. Exactly. Because if he were his savior, this would be no problem. Okay. Yes, I'm giving it up because I know that you're what I want. Okay. But then the second thing that's kind of cheating because I've studied this passage before, but not before mm -hmm. we got in here. So... And when it says disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And that word disheartened right there, mm -hmm. it's used in one other place. And I love this. So it's used <laughs> in one other place. I know this. And it's when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane mm. and he's grieving. Yeah. He is grieving. That's the other place. So in one way, he's disheartened because he knows that he's fixing to have to, that he's got mm -hmm. to bow down to his, to his father, to his savior, yeah. that the rich man has to bow down to his savior, which is his things. Yeah. And Jesus, same place is fixing to bow down to his father, Yeah. but it's the real, it's the real deal. You know, you see that kind of one has fallen victim to the idol mm -hmm. and the other one is in the authentic Lord. Yeah. And, just that those there that runs through this whole thing for me mm -hmm. is that they're they're seeing for the first time maybe the the idea of everything that was in their culture that said the more you have the more status the more power you have the Pharisees the kings the rulers mm -hmm. that's where the the power that's where the saving will come and for the first time they're seeing, they're starting to see oh wait the Messiah is coming quiet like a lamb. So this is a confrontation of our entire human value system and kind of our societal hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Like it challenges everything about what humanity tends to set up for ourselves in terms of what matters, what doesn't matter, who's important, who's not important, and the value of things, mm -hmm. right? Someone's personal value and the value of stuff. And so this is a confrontation then, and it points out that this, this young man's salvation was in his stuff. Like he was depending on his stuff to procure and provide for him a salvation and a significance. Mm -hmm. And he knew he wasn't going to be able to not do it. Yep. And so he, mm -hmm. he couldn't do what Jesus said, and so he's disheartened, and he leaves. And then he has this dialogue with the disciples that is around that same idea that's now confronting their assumptions, which is a very human way to see the world in reality. And he's confronting some basic assumptions they have about who's in and who's out. Because how who's, difficult. Who matters and who, you know. They were amazed when Jesus. So we aren't amazed by that, right? To me, that's not amazing. Right. How difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Yeah. That's not amazing to me, right? But it was amazing to them. And it says, not only amazed, but astonished, astonished. at one point. They were it was astonished. contrary to everything that had ever been taught. Oh, wait, hold on. You know, it was completely contrary <laughs> about how it was. I, I think of like, like 
the the hand gesture just like just like what mind, mind blown. blown right that's what's happening for them they are amazed and so it's confronting them it's also going to confront those that are receiving this gospel as it's being circulated as mark is trying to you know based on peter's teaching mm-hmm. explain life in the kingdom uh, membership in the kingdom yeah who the king is and what he demands and like, what is this kingdom yeah and so there's this new value system that's mm-hmm. being you know expressed here and and that we're fixing to see it play out yeah. in the first century church in big ways when big people were ways. willing to be poor yep in order to be part of this kingdom. give up all they had to live in common and mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff that was about to play out and so it confronts them and i think where we experience that meaning you know, and the significance that we find in this is, is it similar? Does this confront Mm -hmm. us the way that it confronts them? I think it does. I think it does. But man, Chad, I don't, sometimes I, I, I think we're in a worse off place because we know that the wealthy man won't be saved. Right, we know we're, this stuff. Mm-hmm, we're aware of that. And yet we're happy to close this book mm-hmm. and go get into our car and live a comfortable life mm-hmm. for the most part and have stuff like in the United States, we live, even if you think you're poor in the United oh, States, you, you live. live in the top like 5% in all of the world in terms of stuff and wealth. Mm-hmm. And so we, we're a very abundant, com- you know, country, and it's very difficult for us to let go of our stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's not a sin to be wealthy. No. It says that. It's a hindrance to be wealthy. Yeah. It's a, it's a great challenge mm-hmm. if you're wealthy because it's easy. It's very tempting. The human heart will latch on to that wealth and, and allow it to have a meaning mm-hmm. and an importance in life and an attachment that... God knows our hearts are drawn to that stuff. And so it becomes, yeah, not impossible, but certainly a hindrance and a challenge. It's a, and it's, you know, and, and this is trivial, but it, we see it every day. I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll expose my heart in this. Like the way I get up and get dressed is going to, that's so simple and shallow and vain. But the way I get up and get dressed, if I'm examining the depths of my heart, there's a bit of a savior. I'm, I'm mm. relying on that in some yeah. ways. I, I realize that sounds really small, but that th- there's no small sin. There's no small idol, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that in, in the worst of my days, that mm. idol is very evident that I, the, the way I look and how I present myself is how I want people to mm-hmm. form an opinion about me rather than based on who I am in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's a simple thing, but it's small on the good days, but it's not small on the, bad days yeah and it's evident and it's gross so that just that little shallow insignificant thing can pervade in my entire life yeah you know that's and so i think the comfort i see from this text is when we look at this and we go okay he says that it's essentially that it's impossible Mm -hmm. what he's saying is impossible is that that we could somehow think that we are uh, worthy or a deserving of any kind of salvation that we could somehow earn it, manufacture it, uh, be eligible for it. And he says, no. And he's like, yes, this is impossible for humanity, but it's not impossible for God. And at the beginning, this guy was right to identify Jesus as good because he is God and he is capable, even though we're not. And so even as we approach a, a text like this and we go, woo, this one hits home. I've got some heart issues around mm-hmm. my stuff, around my money, uh, the way that I see it, my relationship with all of my stuff. I got some issues, mm-hmm. but praise be to God that Jesus paid it all. And he's doing a work in me now and will continue to do a work in me as I trust in him. Cause he's not only my Lord, but he's also my savior. Mm, and I believe that. that attachment to my belongings. Yeah, he's going to save he's me paid from, from that. that. Yeah. He has paid for that. And what peace in that. Yeah. Because the truth is, is um, probably anyone who's listening in America would identify with a rich one, young ruler. Yeah, for sure. I'd have a hard time laying down everything. I would. Good stuff. Really good.
All righty. Well, Casey, yeah, for it. thanks so much for being here. Thanks for jumping yeah. into this text. And thanks for dropping some cool like, hey, by the way, this disheartened word. Check it out. Also happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, if you're listening, go check that out and see what Jesus is going through. And so a little description of what disheartened looks like. Uh, If you're uh, tuning in and you have questions, if there's something that came up out of this text, maybe something we didn't say or look at, there's a lot to cover here. And so if you want to chime in, uh, leave comments, uh, smash the like button, subscribe, and then, yeah, write comments and leave those. Uh, My hope is that dialogues start to happen based on these episodes and people start to engage with each other as they wrestle through the text. Take it in to your family, to your friends, and have that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you have questions for us, please email me at takeandreadpodcast at gmail.com. I can also send any questions you have for Casey. I can send them her way. Uh, but thank you so much for checking it out. And if you enjoyed it and if you like it, uh, please share it. Tell other folks about this. Because uh, my goal is that we get more and more people taking and reading the Word of God. I want to give a shout out to 22 Beans. Thank you so much for your, their support. Uh, you can go to 22beans.com and go order some yummy coffee. You can also check out some merch there. I have three styles of hats there. I'm not wearing one now, but um, they've, I've got three hats there. So that also helps support the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Casey. Yes. And for all of you out there, go take and read. Blessings. <laughs>